starting recording. I'll come back to the slides here. We are doing office hours to make sure that we're sharing lots of great AT resources across the region here in Region 3. Um, we also know that um, using assistive and instructional technologies is tied to student achievements, as is shown in one of the high leverage practices through the Council for Exceptional Children. Whenever we're looking at assistive technology, we think about the set framework, that's the student, the environments, the tasks, and then the tools. And of course, with all of that, we use a lens of equity to make sure that every student is getting exactly what it is that they need. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa King and Red Bjordahl, who is who are going to talk to us about some centers and using assistive technology in those. So I'll go ahead and mute myself, but tell me when to uh, turn the slides for you. Well, hi, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming today. Um, I'm Melissa King and I've been a special ed teacher for 23 years um, and currently holding a deaf hard of hearing position at ISD 318 and IASC. And Ren and I met mm, probably 10 years ago uh, when I was the special ed teacher and she was the speech clinician. So we uh, traversed some, um, some wavy waters for multiple years trying to figure out the best ways to implement evidence-based practice and meet the needs of our students and kind of had fun with it and worked hard and were able to overcome some obstacles to give students access, so. Ren, you gonna say anything? I'm Ren. Well, you introduced <laughs> me so nicely. I didn't feel like I had to. Uh, I'm Ren Bjordahl, yeah, speech language pathologist, um, ISC 318. And I've been doing this, this is my 10th year. So um, yeah, just like Melissa said, when I first started in the schools, um, I met her and we both just had this feeling of like, we need to work on generalization. We really need to work on using these skills in a functional way. How can we make that happen and not have it be a ton of planning and time and, um, you know, just make it consistent. So I think we're just going to share like some of the hurdles we had um, and then how we kind of fix those and how, how it worked for us. And hopefully, even if you can take one or two of these ideas and make it work for you, then that's great. All right, for the sake of this training, we're going to look at learning centers as an area in the classroom which contains a collection of activities and materials to teach reinforce and or enrich a skill or concept. Um, with that being said, I think that it's important to, to make a decision prior to going into this, what your, what your purpose is. Uh, when you have a learning center, there's a time and a place for teaching and there's a time and a place for reinforcing. So if you choose to use it as a teaching center, it's gonna be very important that you are able to, to be able to man or to facilitate that particular center on a consistent basis. Um, if you're going to use it as reinforcing or enriching, um, then you're going to want to make sure that you're implementing activities that have not been that have been mastered. So you're looking at skills that you can reinforce or enrich. So then you're having independence, um, but you're not looking at independent activities that the, the students have not mastered yet. So um, I think that sometimes we get a little get a little bit excited and gung-ho and then we're like, ooh, let's do this and let's do this. And then we go and we try it and then it's a flop and we're like, well, why is it a flop? And it's like, well, because I didn't know how to do it. Um, so what what Red and I learned is that it's important to start with the, um, with the previously mastered skills or more play skills to teach the, the systems and the operational aspects of the centers and then gradually progress into um, more teaching re and reinforcing. Yeah, and some people will talk about that kind of as like pre-learning skills or um, just those skills needed to, you know, understand the routine and the transitions and that kind of stuff too, which is often IEP goals as well, so. <laughs> Go ahead, Julie. I think you have to, oh yeah. Go ahead, Melissa. All right, so why use centers? Uh, centers enables learners to work in various groups and same and mixed abilities. It encourages active participation among learners. It enables learners to make decisions, follow directions, work independently, and self-monitor. It gives students an opportunity to learn responsibility and organization, and it facilitates individualized learning. 
Um, so as as much as sometimes we look at centers, it might not because it's not a mastered skill. We might be like, oh wow, they're but they're not getting in anything out of it. It is a very 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 rich activity. Um, like Ren said, it's embedded ac academics. Uh, there's transition skills. There's time skills. There's stop. There's all done. You know. There's a, I don't want to be done, but it's time to transition time, you know. So there are a lot of embedded skills that you can, um, that you can really focus on and teach in this activity. Um, so that it's just, it's very rich. You can go ahead. All right. Oh, so, oh. You can go, Melissa. That's fine. Go ahead. Oh, this is just kind of the setup that Melissa and I used in the program that we had at Southwest Elementary. And um, we just had three centers in our room. I think primarily that was space, which we'll talk more about later, but also just the number of kids we had. We took that into account. But you can see um, each center kind of had a targeted skill or um, activity. And like Melissa said, a lot of these skills, this, we knew the students could either do them or could participate in some way um, rather than, so if we were focusing on like transitions, we wouldn't make sure it was an activity that they were motivated motivated by and able to participate in. Um, and then Wednesdays, the reason why they're empty is we had those early release days. So we actually did a whole group activity on those days. Is that right, Melissa? Yep. Is that what we did? What do you want to add to that section? Nothing. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, and then we just wanted to talk about possible skills that or activities you could incorporate into centers. And I think Melissa's already talked a little bit about this, um, depending on the level of your students. Um, so you could do interactive play and you can just go through the list. Um, Julie. Math, um, so you have a math skills, writing, independent reading, um, social skills are really important because all of these activities become social when it's a group activity communication so speech and language skills um, and we'll talk more about how um, this is especially helpful for functional communication because it's so natural it's like a natural setting fine motor so incorporating those ot skills um, and a lot of kids will have ot as part of their iep so this is a really great way to reinforce those skills um, puzzles obviously cognitive and motor Edmark was a reading program that Melissa did use um, in some of our centers and star as well. Right, Melissa, that was a was that read. No, that was just any type of skill. Right. The star program. Oh, uh, I use the star curriculum and then the star star theme based curriculum. Oh, OK. Um, you could do art projects um, and then really just embedding those specific IEP goals. And we kind of touched on that where it could be an academic goal, could be a communication goal. Um, it could just be we're working on um, sitting at a table and participating in the activity. Um, we're working on um, transitioning to and from activities. So it really could be so many different types of goals, obviously, and more. <laughs> I don't know if this is exhaustive. Have you thought of any other ideas, Melissa? No, I just think that it's just real, like I said, really important if you're going to facilitate a center that you can do the teaching. Otherwise, these are activities. So, for instance, the Edmark or the Star, I use, I would facilitate that center so I could work on it with, you know, one to three kids, however many were in that group, um, versus, you know, more of like the the tracing the writing. Um, like Ren said, uh, I always made sure I implemented fine motor into it. Um, being that so many different um, service providers in the fine motor are working towards um, generalizing that skill, it was always nice to make sure that I could have that in the as the center so we could work on pencil grips, we could work on scissors, we could work on cutting, we could work on that kind of stuff. Um, so then those, those students were able to have more of the OT activities um, daily rather than once or twice a month. And you didn't have to add like an additional part of your day. So if the occupational therapist said, I really need you to work on cutting, you didn't have to set aside another time to work on cutting because you just incorporated it right into your center system that you had set up. Um, and I think that's one of the huge pluses that we found is that we were able to get a bunch of those um, different services into the structure we already had in place. Um, I'm just going to touch briefly on the communication benefits, and I know Melissa already has touched on this. Um, so obviously, when I was able to be in the room, I did this five days a week, and I had 
I think I serviced all of the kids in this room, right, Melissa? 14, 13? And most of them were in the room for centers, but not all. A couple of the kids maybe were out in the gen ed during that time. Um, but it just, I saw right away that there were so many opportunities for language use, um, not only for functional communication, but also that language we use to help with those things like transitions and routines and the use of schedules and all of those visual supports um, that we use. You can click ahead. Um, and I just really wanted to touch on, I mentioned uh, the authentic and natural language use. So these learning centers are types of small group work that kids are gonna do all of the time in school, no matter what level um, they are at. You know, if they're in the general education a lot, or if they're being pulled onto the resource room for support, both of those settings, they're gonna be experiencing these small group setting um, for, for academic and, um, even for social activities. So I just think it was so authentic. And it does create like a safe environment to practice these things. It provides lots of modeling opportunities for the adults. And I did wanna add here, it also provides modeling opportunities for me and the other staff. So one of the biggest benefits that I saw being in Melissa's room, I was in there for 28 minutes, <laughs> um, but five days a week um, was that I was able to support that modeling for the ESP staff and Melissa and vice versa. Um, so the communication between myself and the staff just skyrocketed. And I think also me being able to explain why we're doing things and, and then for everyone to see what's working and what's not working um, created a natural place and time to just have those conversations. Like, well, let's try this instead. And I found when I did a lot of pull out therapy, especially for um, kids who spend time in the resource room, it just didn't feel functional. And I didn't have that carryover or the time to train staff. So this just kind of built all of that in, you know, into my everyday work. Um, high engagement because we changed up the activities every day um, they might have similar activities every week, but every day it was a new activity. And so the kids, you know, they had a lot of variety and I think that, um, helped keep them motivated and then just opportunities to practice those skills. Every single center you're practicing the communication skills. Um, you might be, I might be providing a little bit more support and instructional things in my center, but you know, all of the staff is, is pr practicing those skills. Anything else I'm missing, Melissa, that we talked about? No. Communication piece. The other thing I did also just want to add, um, oh, this was a great point. That when you're in a center's activity and you're kind of, if you're not doing direct instruction, you're doing that practicing interactive, it really centers the students rather than the adults as a teacher. And I think students become models for each other. And when we're using like assistive technology or picture boards, all of the kids started using them, whether they were speaking or non speaking. And I think that was sort of a beautiful thing because it motivated every kid to be interested in those tools. And um, yeah, we had a lot of speaking kids who would like share the boards with the kids who might need it. You know, it was almost like they were becoming the teachers. And I, I just really loved that. And it was received really well um, by all of the all of the students. I do just want to add that you're absolutely right. It was nice to have you come in because then you were able to model some of the assistive technology and the carryover was a lot. It was at a higher rate just because they could see it and they, you weren't perfect. So then it's not like they were intimidated by it because you would make mistakes or we would make mistakes and they'd make mistakes and we would all laugh about it and then we'd try again. So um, it was a perfect learning environment for all of us. Yeah. And I think we're going to talk more about that in a couple of slides, but the idea that, um, all of this is learning for the kids and the teachers sometimes because when you try to individualize it, these skills um you're gonna falter and you're gonna have to troubleshoot and think of new ideas and new ways to support kids and they're not all gonna work <laughs> that's part of the process and i had to become okay with that i have a little bit of a type a personality <laughs> melissa, <laughs> melissa shaking her head so that you know she helped me grow in that way too like it's okay that it didn't work we're just gonna try something different tomorrow <laughs> um so that that was a good learning experience for myself. <laughs> are we ready for the next one? I think. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So these are just a couple helpful hints. So one of the things that we know is time is money and it's precious and nobody has enough of it. So um, one of the nice things about this, doing a center's activity is you can work smarter, not harder. So uh, before you get started, this is something you want to kind of work out and get some quirks out before you implement it so that you can 
you can forward think rather than react. So the best part to do is to make a plan. Um, the examples that are shown, some people do centers that are flexible in nature. Um, what we did was we did centers that were student grouped and they rotated in a circle. So in the room, they went from one place to another to another. So we knew that one group went from here to there to there. So for both students and staff, we knew exactly what was happening so we could execute that plan. Like Ren said, we were able to model some expectations, whether it was for the communication, whether it was for transition, whether it was for using your manners, what are we cleaning up, like the, those expectations could embed a lot of IEP goals as well. What we learned too is that the smaller groups were better. We had anywhere from, depending on the day, if you, you know, illnesses and that kind of stuff, between one and four kids. We tried not to go over four kids, you know, if, if there were four kids in three centers, that's you know, 12 kids in the room and then you add adults and it gets pretty busy. Um, but it was a nice way to make sure we were able to provide service for everybody. Well, and you can always ramp it up. Like if you start small and then you see another kid benefiting, you can start to add them in. Um, and I think that made it easier for us yeah. also just to kind of swallow like this new thing. Um, let's just start small and work up from that. Yep. Uh, the other thing that's going to be super duper beneficial is the use of a timer, and we'll talk about it later. But when you're making your plans for your centers, plan on starting every center with the exact same number of minutes. So if you start with three minutes, then every center is three minutes. Um, that's not just for the kids, but it's not fair for them to have a three minute center the first time and then a 16 minute one because the kids were quiet the next time. You know, that's not teaching anything. You're, you know, so. Um, use a timer. It's good for the kids and the students, the kids and the students, the kids and the staff. Sorry. Well, it's good for us to know, too, like what the plan is. <laughs> no. And nobody had to guess. Ooh, how long do I have to keep them here? This one's having a hard time. They're not very engaged. It's going to be a long time. Um, so <laughs> using that timer, then everybody knows how long. Then being consistent is also really important. You know, we uh, we put our students in a group and then we were consistent with what group they were because then they weren't bouncing around you're following through you're being consistent it just really makes things easier for when staff are coming in and out yeah oh, we, we might make changes at some point but it was always strategic like oh i think so and so would really learn from so and so let's put them in a group let's transition it but it wasn't just like all of a sudden melissa tells me oh joey's going to be in your group it was we talked about it and planned it ahead and then, like Ren and I said, we've had lots of a lots of uncomfortable times. Um, when you're starting, you want to, you want to have bumps in the road. It's not going to be perfect, but just because there's a bump, that doesn't mean that you need to rush a change. That doesn't mean you take an activity out. That doesn't mean you change a group. That's part of learning. We all have bumps in the road. So consider your bumps. Um, uh, collaborate with your staff about your bumps, and then determine if there's if you need to make a change or what kind of change needs to be made and then the last thing like ren and i've always said it's not going to be perfect it's not always pretty some days you're rock stars some days it's a total hot mess um but then you go ahead and you try it again the next day anything you want to add ren no i think, I think that's good oh now we can track logistics <laughs> melissa was amazing at this and um i learned a lot about it because um just of watching her and talking to her and helping her create materials but you can see th this is very similar i don't think you were quite as color coded but you had all of the the bins set up ahead of time um and it just made everyone esps myself like we knew what was coming on monday in the monday bin that's what we were doing monday yellow that's what we're doing tuesday red this is what we're doing and um it just took all of the stress of planning out of the equation on a daily basis so um why don't and when you she says, explain a little bit about that yeah so um every monday if it's abc puzzles then the abc puzzles will are always in that bin every tuesday was watercolor everything that you need was in that bin so then the kids knew oh today's tuesday it's yellow i get to paint or Today it's cutting, today it's, you know, go fish or wind up toys, you know? So we we made sure that we incorporated activities that would be both functional and communication based. Um, and then they were, everything you needed was in that bin. So not, you weren't having to go in and to recreate, you know, every once in a while you change things up, but the consistency is what really made it 
um, effective because then the students knew what to expect when they were coming to that center. Well, and the ESPs, because a lot of times you and I be rushing from A to C to B, and then they would just pull the materials out and get them ready so that when we were transitioning to centers, it was all at the tables and ready to go. And, um, you know, it's a little bit more work up front, I think, just creating the bins um, and the organizational system, but it pays off so much <laughs> in the long run. And then Melissa would, sh would change it up. So, um, you know, we were doing the core word. So that would be the center that I worked at with primarily is whatever activity it would be targeted at a core word, but we would work on all communication skills. Um, and then the other centers, what would you do like a month? Like for a month, you do ABC puzzles on Mondays, and then the next month you might do a different kind of puzzle. I can't remember. Does that sound no. like right? Yeah, it all just kind of depended on the students and their level of engagement or their level of mastery. If a skill um, was mastered by multiple kids, then I might change it up. Or yeah, or if they, if we need, if there was something going on and it was holiday time and they needed more downtime, may, maybe maybe uh, went back to more play based or you know something not necessarily as functionally academic, something more engaging. Depended all on what was going on. Kind of the time of the year and and where we were. Um, so it wasn't like the entire year they did ABCs on Monday, <laughs> right? It did shift over time, but it would still maybe be like a puzzle-based activity. Um, Perfect. Yeah. I think that's it, right? <laughs> okay. And this one is just really simple. Um, it would be dreamy if we all had a classroom that looked like that image. But this kind of goes back to the organization and the system. The purpose of this was just, you know, when we did it, instead of having, we didn't let the kids pick which centers, you know, in a mainstream class, they would be able to pick which center they were going to go. But we would facilitate it in a, in a way that we knew which group was where and where they were going. So then um, it was a little bit more of a less hot mess when we were transitioning because those transitions in the beginning were very hard. Um, we used to have to do transi transition activities like, all right, it was broken down at task analysis as much as stand up, push your chair in, we're going to hop to the next one, sit down, you know. So depending on the level of where your students are depends on the the, the level of need for transitions and 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 fostering that positive transition. Um, but the only reason I bring up the organization is it, it is just nice if you can do it in a circular motion, like I said, so the kids go in a group instead of um, zigzagging everywhere so you can manage a lot easier. And obviously as their skills grow, or if you're in a classroom where kids have a little higher skills with that, you can start to work on more of like choosing a center because that's another skill that's going to be needed in the general education room. So you just kind of have to individualize that to where your students are. The room we happened to be in was very heavy with um, transitions and working on using a timer and those verbal cues and visual schedules. So, you know, um, that's kind of the level we were at, but you can adjust this however you need. And the other thing I just wanted to mention is, you know, our setup was, we had two tables for centers, but the other center kids either sat at a desk or sometimes they just were on the floor doing like puzzles or building. Um, so it doesn't have to be like three tables or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, you can make it however, however it works for your space. Perfect. And again, um, Back to the use of visual timers. Um, it's important for not no, only the students, but the staff to know how long it's gonna be, how long they're gonna be there. Um, we had the timer on the smart board and we had one particular student who literally would sit at the table and was so disengaged in everything except how much longer he had to be there. <laughs> and and it took us a long time before we were able to to get over that gap of him being more in tune to the timer and how long he had to be there and then more engaged in the center. Um, so, uh, so it goes both ways. Um, but timers are consistent and predictable. They're both for student and staff. Um, start small, like I said, if it's the first center is three minutes and then you go to three and a half and work your way up to eight minutes, that's awesome. Um, and then just making the, the timer part of your procedure is just really beneficial. All right, and like we've talked about, you know, some of the centers were super duper engaging and some of them, you know, then then we have the one who was more interested in the timer. Just because a student or a group of students is not necessarily highly engaged doesn't mean you should totally change things up. 
you know, your centers might start with some of that high attention and that high engagement. And then as you fostered your procedure and your, um, your ebb and flow of the centers, um, then you can start including other activities that might not necessarily be as highly engaging um, because once they're predictable, um, then they do become engaging. When a student knows what's expected, um, their engagement changes. And so I just think, know, yeah, go ahead. Or just know that just if, if they're not engaged a day or two doesn't mean that you totally swap it out and you know you're not you're not putting on fancy circus lights to get them to sit there. Well, sometimes it felt like it, but it did, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'm lying. Maybe there was there was a little bit more work to keep them there on some days than others. But yeah, yeah. I think you know we started out with a lot of play based centers, and the the play was still educational in some way, um, or goal oriented in some way. But I think we started with those um, activities that the kids were really motivated by, so that we could target what we were really working on was more of that transitional work and understanding the processes and how to um, use those um, pre-learning skills. And then we would, we just slowly, you know, transitioned into things that were maybe a little bit harder, more challenging for students. And um, like, Melissa, sorry, <laughs> once Melissa, um, you know, had, once we had like a baseline with most of the students, then we were able to challenge them um, a little bit harder, more academically or, um, maybe motor wise, depending on the students. Um, I did also want to add that, um, you know, in the planning piece, and Melissa and I talked a lot about this this morning when we were chatting. Um, one of the things that we did was we prioritized the scheduling of our centers because we really wanted to maximize a couple of things. One, we wanted to maximize the students when they could be in the room all at the same time. That was really important. And then two, when we would be able to have the support staff that we needed. Um, and so we, those were priorities for us and it made a really big difference because like we said, um, not only were we helping with the training piece with the ESPs, but also they supported us in making the system work. And I know that that's not, you know, some people feel like that's very, very challenging, but it was a, we had to really make that a priority. Do you wanna talk a little bit more about that, Melissa? Just, um, cause it was a bit of a barrier at first when we looked at scheduling. And it, yeah, but because we made it a priority, it then um, once we knew that we had, we were able to implement that structure and that consistency in the procedure, then as the year went on, then we were able to, to change things up or didn't need as much um, support. But if this is something that you want to start new with, I would, I would highly suggest you starting it at the beginning of the year and making it a part of your daily and then change it as, make changes as possible as, it, as you go on. And one of the main reasons why she says that at the beginning of the year is because you have a little bit more control over setting that schedule. Once other things are added in, other services, um, other needs for the student, it's a lot harder than to add centers in um, because it's harder to find a time when all the kids are available. So, um, you know, that's a realistic concern and, and it did take us some time to figure that out. But also, if you if you consider all the IEP goals, you can bet in this up to 28 minutes by the time we got there. Um, there's a lot of uh, documentation. There's a lot of implementation, implementation and embedding of IEP goals, positive social interactions. Um, somebody might walk in and be like, oh, wow, they're just playing Play-Doh on a Friday. It's like, yeah, if you only knew what they did to get to the Play-Doh, you know, <laughs> um, because there were some students that we knew what center, that what was their last one, just so we knew we could get them to do the first two. So then they were reinforced with the last one. So, um, yeah, it's it's uh, well worth it. I will say that there were times um, over my career where I did it centers two times. Uh, if you're familiar with centers, you also may have used the teach model. Um, the teach model is also very, very structured. It's um, it's the, pretty much the same basis, um, but it's individualized. So that's another method that you might want to consider just because um, that independence is really good for the kids. Questions? <laughs> All right. Amazing content. Um, yeah. Anyone in the audience, if you have questions or answers, I'll stop sharing my screen here. Feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand or type in the chat window. And Hi, um, I do have a question. I missed the beginning, so you may have said this, but 
uh, in those different centers that you have, I used to use task boxes a lot um, for independent work. Uh, is that similar to that? Or do you have somebody at every station that you have, an adult? Or is this more meant to be where they work independently? So the difference between centers and a task box is a task box is typically created for one task and one student to do. The right. centers, we did a little bit more of a small group. Um, like Ren said, we started more with the play base and stuff. Um, if you go back and we, we included things like puzzles, Play-Doh, pegboards, games, social skills, evidence-based practice curriculum. So we kind of incorporated a lot of things in our centers um as a group and then because we were able to embed the communication we did have you know if ren was doing a center and i was doing a center we facilitated those centers and maybe the other center was more independent and it was something that was enriching or reinforcing it wasn't um a skill that we were teaching but there usually was okay. an esp available to just kind of monitor and support those behavioral or adaptive skills um is that what you call is that a para yeah, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, like an aid. Yeah. Okay. What does Thanks. ESP stand for? Great. I'm an extra special person, but I'm sure. Oh, it's ESP. I think it's educational support. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. That's um, what we call it in our district. So. Yeah. Well, and in everywhere I've worked, we've called them paras. <laughs> Excuse me. Except in Hibbing now, <clears throat> when I came here, they call them PSAs. So it's people support assistant, but yeah. mm -hmm. I still call them paras because that's easier for me. <laughs> um, I just wanted to piggyback on too, you know, we did have that, the luxury that Melissa and I were really dedicated to both being there during centers. So that gave us two adults to facilitate two of the centers. And I think that that's really important. I think if you're working with a team that is invested and engaged in this process, you'll you'll get a lot of more support. I think even maybe a CODA, an OT assistant could potentially facilitate one of the centers. It really just depends on your team and where your students are. Um, maybe even they only come one day a week, but that's one day a week where they're facilitating a center for you. Or maybe the OT and the speech therapist swap in and out because of their availability. So you, you have a lot of flexibility but I think thinking about this from my perspective as a service provider, I saw a lot more growth with my functional communicators um, and my social skills students when I was in the classroom doing my services that way. So, so what age range were you focusing on here? This was an elementary room. Oh, so we had okay. kindergarten through fourth grade for severe profound. Oh, okay. Okay. So, and before you even said having the CODA do it, I was thinking that same thing because our CODA has been doing much more of um, push-in type services, mm -hmm. which I love. But if you have them at a center and they don't see all the kids for OT, do you still just rotate them all through her station? That's, we what, did. that's how we did it. Um, okay. My opinion of that is the students are either really good role models for their peers or they're learning something different from being in that center. So I may be working with a core board with one student who's not speaking, but my speaking students are working on expanding their utterances. You know, like we're kind of working on two different things, but on the same activity. And I think, a, you know, an OT or a CODA would hopefully see the value in that too. But it does take time and practice and it is intimidating the first couple of times you do it. Like, oh, what am I doing? Um, well, and I'm just thinking too, if their time is, you know, 20 minutes one time a week and your oh, yes. station is six I minutes. I adjusted my minutes for my students and I just, um, I did it like a cycle and a certain amount of minutes in a cycle. So I could do- oh, okay eight minutes, eight or 10 minutes a day, four days a week versus 20 minutes, two times a week. Okay. Um, and I think that, you know, OT may or may not have that flexibility depending on right. the program. As a speech therapist, I had a lot more flexibility in how I wrote those minutes for my students. Mm -hmm. um, but that way too, like if I missed a session, I could just come in in the morning and get 20 minutes during morning meeting and, and try to adjust however needed. Mm -hmm. so. That That's a cool great. idea. I really like that idea because I think of our speech. Uh, <clears throat> now I'm moving from the coda to speech, but you know, she'll pull the kids aside in her office and work with them on the TH sounds or whatever. But you know, I've always thought, wouldn't that be so much more beneficial to do it right within the classroom where they're using those words rather than 
drilling them on words and that yeah. kind of thing. So that's a cool yeah. idea. I'm going to have to talk to her about doing that. And I like another, that. You can mention to another model for a couple of the students that I saw in a different resource, resource room um, that was more mild, moderate DCD is I would see them one time a week by themselves or in a small group in my office. And then mm -hmm. the other day I would go into like a literacy center mm -hmm. and support mm -hmm. teacher and carry over of those skills. So, I mean, you know, it's taken me a lot, a lot of years to kind of get to this model. It's not something that I learned naturally right. in education, but, um, when you start to see that generalization and carry over, it's usually mm -hmm. motivating. And then you would learn the oh. techniques to use with the kids too. I think that's mm -hmm. good. All right. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to jump in. Catherine Hatfield typed a question in the chat window too. She said, what suggestions do you have for grouping kids? Like who with who? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> depending on the kids that were there, you know, we had some that were like, nope, these two are not going to be together. Um, right away. <laughs> yeah. And then we had some that were like, ooh, that one would be a great model for that one. Or personality wise or behavior wise, or, you know, we had some medical kids safety wise, whether it was a wheelchair or, you know, we, we always considered that as two as grouping, you know, just because, you know, the physical ability as well. Um, because if they were coming in a standard and the other ones, you know, then you kind of kind of changed as as the students did. Um, so, Catherine, that's a great question. Um, the other nice thing about that, too, is, is that um, you can make those changes. Um, like I said, if you try it and it's just a hot mess and it's not worth it, um, then you make the changes. But otherwise, if you can if you can make it work, you know, like I said, those embedding those IP goals is crazy because you can get some pretty positive um interactions as well as modeling too so um but catherine no that was that was that that's hard it's a learning process um just with every single student because um sometimes you do want to put those kids, kids together because you want to work on those social interactions mm -hmm. and help them learn how to interact together in a positive way um that doesn't look pretty every day but it is you know it sometimes is the goal um i think that what melissa said at the beginning of this whole presentation was really stepping back and thinking about like what is my purpose for this like if my purpose for joey is to work on um transitions um then that's that's going to lead where you want to group him and what order of centers you might want to do with him and if you're working for another student, you really want to just work on modeling that core board, then you're going to make sure that um, they're with another student who maybe uses the core board already. So you're really looking at each student individually and thinking like, what is my purpose? What is my main goal? You might have several um, when you're making those decisions. It really is so individualized. So I don't know if we can give you like one blanket statement <laughs> for that. Um, and we learned that sometimes we make the wrong choice. <laughs> And Catherine just typed in there, thank you so much for this session. So um, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording, but we can hang around for a little while longer. People still have questions, comments, answers.